In this lecture, we're going to talk about the ways of clinically reasoning through bleeding. That is, more than just getting the coags and platelets when someone is bleeding, I want to walk you through the pathophysiology of bleeding, which will help us in future lectures, as well as an algorithm for reasoning to the diagnosis, even without getting a lot of unnecessary tests. Recognizing that when you're in the hospital or in the clinic, you often order tests to save time, that is, order a bunch of tests at once, kind of shotgunning the approach. But I want to show you how you can reasonably reason through the diagnosis without getting a lot of tests. Let's start off with the pathophysiology, starting with primary hemostasis. Primary hemostasis is all about platelets. And primary hemostasis occurs in three phases. The first phase is where endothelial injury occurs. From the endothelium is released these Velcro-like structures that reaches out and grabs onto platelets. This is von Willebrand's factor. The platelets have a protein on them. It's always expressed and it's always on the membrane. It just happens to stick to von Willebrand's factor. That is glycoprotein 1B. This process by which endothelial injury leads to von Willebrand factor release and sticking to glycoprotein 1B, grabbing platelets to the endothelial injury, is called adhesion. When these platelets get adhered, they get excited. And the excited platelet releases thromboxane A2 and ADP. There are other molecules that are released as well, but these are the only two that are clinically relevant. All platelets possess thromboxane A2 receptors and ADP receptors. When this platelet experiences the thromboxane A2 and ADP of the activated platelet, it too activates. This step, activation, causes the expression of th more thromboxane A2 and more ADP, as well as a glycoprotein 2B3A. The reason why this happens is to get platelets to aggregate the third step in the end of primary hemostasis. Aggregation is mediated by glycoprotein 2B 3A. And what happens is the end product is endothelial injury connected to these platelets by von Willebrand factor who are connected to each other by glycoprotein 2B3A and connected via fibrinogen. The final product, the platelet plug, consists of activated platelets that are stuck to each other by glycoprotein 2B3A and fibrinogen and stuck to the site of endothelial injury von, by von Willebrand's factor and glycoprotein 1B. This may seem overwhelming, but this is the point at which primary hemostasis ends and secondary hemostasis begins. You'll see the relevance of this platelet plug surrounded by a fibrinogen mesh in just a second after we finish talking about secondary hemostasis. Secondary hemostasis is all about factors. And if you spent as much time as I did trying to learn the clotting cascade, you probably realized you wasted an awful lot of time. Let me show you an easier way of remembering what the clotting cascade does. There is a common pathway. There is an extrinsic pathway and an intrinsic pathway. The 
the extrinsic pathway is exclusive. You just have to remember factor seven is in the extrinsic pathway. Extrinsic pathway is exclusive, so there's only one factor in there, and that's seven. The common pathway can be remembered by one five and five, two fives and ten. One five and five, two fives and ten. There's one five and five, and there's two fives and ten. If you know the common pathway is one five and five, two fives and ten, and the extrinsic pathway is exclusive in seven, it means the intrinsic pathway is everything else. You just have to know that factor 10 bridges in intrinsic and extrinsic into the common pathway. That's all you really need to know about secondary hemostasis, except that factor 1 is the last step in the creation of a clot. Factor 1 goes to its activated form 1A. But you probably know this by a different name. 1A is actually fibrin. And 1 is fibrin ogen. Where does fibrinogen come from? The whole point of primary hemostasis forming a platelet plug at the site of endothelial injury tied down by von Willebrand's factor is to ensure that there is substrate for a fibrin clot to form at the site of endothelial injury. The platelet plug stops the bleeding, but is also the substrate for the entire clotting cascade to build a fibrin clot at the site of endothelial disinjury to prevent further bleeding. That's what bleeding is all about. The primary hemostasis is about platelets building a platelet plug. Secondary hemostasis is using that platelet plug to build a fibrin clot. Now the body's not stupid, if you can't just be building clots everywhere, so it knows to break down the fibrin clots into D-dimers, a process mediated by plasmin. Not surprisingly, which comes from plasminogen, mediated by tissue plasminogen activator. This plays a role in the, of when we start treating clots, we give TPA to break up clots. It's also going to come into pulmonary embolism as well as strokes and cardiovascular disease. But let's go back and revisit some of the conditions that are found in primary and secondary hemostasis. We give medications that attempt to stop the, pro the process of thrombosis. If you think about your coronary artery disease patient, you know that that person gets put on aspirin and even maybe aspirin and Plavix. Why do we do that? Well, the goal is to prevent acute arterial thrombosis. If you remember that cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease, has a buildup of a plaque inside the vessel. That plaque limits flow, but what's dangerous about that plaque is if it ruptures, it exposes endothelial tissue and can lead to an acute thrombosis. That acute thrombosis takes a partially obstructed lumen to complete closure and you have a STEMI. The goal of giving them aspirin and Plavix then should be clear. Aspirin inhibits thromboxane A2. Plavix, clopidogrel, inhibits ADP. If you give aspirin and or Plavix, you reduce the amount of activation that occurs and therefore prevents the formation of a platelet plug and a fibrin clot. You give aspirin and Plavix to reduce the chance of acute thrombosis in a coronary vessel. Not surprisingly then, the risk of giving someone aspirin and Plavix increases the bleeding risk you, because you prevent the formation of a platelet plug. Other medications do this, for example, abciximab, which is a glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitor. Glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors prevent aggregation. Same thing, platelet plug can't form. This medication happens to be infused and is only used during coronary interventions. But some disease states can do this as well. Von Willebrand's disease, Glanzmann's thrombostenia, and Bernard Soulier are all congenital disorders of primary hemostasis. 
Bernard Soulier has one B in it. Bernard Soulier has one B, as does glycoprotein, one B. Von Willebrand's disease is a deficiency of von Willebrand's factor. If you ha don't have glycoprotein 1b and you don't have von Willebrand's factor, you don't have adhesion. These are congenital disorders which lead to incre ble increased bleeding risk. Bernard Soulier has 1b. Von Willebrand's disease is easy to remember. Glanzmann's thrombostenia is the other one, which is essentially like having abcixumab all the time. So you can see adhesion, activation, and aggregation. All three of these are the process by which the primary platelet plug forms, which is the substrate for fibrin clots. We can use medications or disease states in order to understand why they present with bleeding and also why we give these to prevent thrombosis. Over in secondary hemostasis, a common medication we use is Coumadin. Coumadin inhibits vitamin K epoxide reductase, an enzyme in the liver that helps the liver make 2, 7, 9, and 10. So if you inhibit 2, 7, 9, and 10, Coumadin blocks both the common pathway at 2 and 10, the extrinsic pathway at 7, and the intrinsic pathway at 9. Just as a small detail to earn your bonus points with your students as you coach them, the reason why we follow the INR and the PT and not the PTT has to do with the half-life of factor 7. But there are new drugs coming out, which makes it so that you also have to know the name of factor 2. You probably know this as thrombin. Because now they're coming out with medications that target different points along the clotting cascade in an attempt to replace Coumadin. You may have heard of some of the 10A inhibitors or the thrombin inhibitors. The 10A inhibitors are apixaban and rivaroxaban. Very well named drug, Zarelto, 10A Relto. Trade name, don't learn it. Thrombin inhibitors are drugs like dabigatran, lepirudin, and argatroban. These medications you might recognize for the treatment of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Dabigatran is a new medication, Pradaxa, which is trying to replace Coumadin in terms of valvular diseases as well as the use of DVT and PE. So you can see now as you start to engage medications, you learn where they work in the clotting cascade and know what their anticipated side effects are going to be. Of course, all these medications can lead to bleeding and all of these medications are going to prevent thrombosis. So I hope that's enough of engaging the pathophysiology of both primary and secondary hemostasis enough to understand the medications that we use and its interaction with our system. The most important thing I want you to take away is that the whole reason the platelet plug forms is to have substrate for fibrin clots to form at the site of endothelial injury. This becomes important as we talk about thrombocytopenia in the next coming lecture. Now that we've got that covered, let's talk about an algorithm for clinically reasoning through what type of bleeding this person has right now. When someone comes in with bleeding, you want to be able to separate primary hemostasis from secondary hemostasis. And what you're looking for is a superficial bleed on primary hemostasis and a deep bleed on secondary. Primary hemostasis is superficial and is going to present with petechia oral or gingival bleeding, and the same tissue as in the, the oral pharynx, the vagina. So the patient who has menometrorrhagia or bleeding gums whenever they brush their teeth or simply have the rash of petechia on their skin is indicative of primary hemostasis. 
Secondary hemostasis is deeper bleeding. These are the patients who are going to have hematomas and hemarthroses. Difficult to miss these. The question comes up all the time, where does epistaxis belong? And it's difficult to answer that question because if it is anterior nose, then it's going to be more superficial. But if it's deep in the oropharynx, it might be secondary hemostasis. So increased bleeding time after surgery or even epistaxis, both of those can kind of be in both directions, which is why it makes sense that people do the next step right off the bat. They get platelet count for the CBC and they get a coag panel. But if you've clinically reasoned into secondary hemostasis, you know that coag panel is going to be abnormal. So why do you get a coag panel? You get it to confirm that you're right. But if you've clinically reasoned there, that's not the next test you want. If you think it's primary hemostasis, you are going to get a CBC because you want to know the platelet count. And let's go down the primary hemostasis pathway first before we revisit the secondary hemostasis. Recognizing that a platelet count and coag panel don't, are not necessary in every person who's bleeding if you can clinically reason. The platelet count is going to show you either a low platelets or normal platelets. If it is a platelet bleeding with normal count, it is a dysfunction of platelets. The platelets are broken. If it is platelet type bleeding with a low platelet count, that is thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia can be its own lecture in entirety, but I want you to see that whenever you don't have enough of something in the body, it only happens in three ways. Either you don't make enough, it's being consumed, or it's hidden. That is production destruction and sequestration. Production issues of thrombocytopenia are going to be primarily bone marrow issues, such as aplastic anemia, or marrow infiltration from cancer. It can be cirrhosis, since the liver is responsible for making TPO, like EPO for hemoglobin, coming from the, lip, the kidneys. The liver makes TPO, which induces bone marrow expression of platelets. So these are the major conditions you should think of when you see a thrombocytopenia in your thinking production. But you must rule out destruction, which is alphabet soup. That is DIC, HIT, TTP, and ITP. This is a whole lecture in and of itself that follows this one. And sequestration is going to occur in a big spleen. Obviously what you do to evaluate each one of these is different. Spleen, get an ultrasound or see if you can feel it. Destruction we'll talk about in the next lecture. And if you've ruled out these disorders, now you're into a production issue. So unless you saw the cirrhotic and confirmed that, there are cirrhosis, that they have cirrhosis leading to the thrombocytopenia, you're probably going to go after a bone marrow biopsy. You got all of that from the type of bleeding and the platelet count. If you come over and said to dysfunction where they have a normal platelet count, now you're talking about some congenital disorders or medications. Von Willebrand's disease definitely is prevalent enough where you'll see it. Glanzmann thrombostenia and Bernard Soulier, the congenital defects that present with the same platelet dysfunction, you aren't going to see because they're so rare. Don't go looking for them. We do this all the time. We cause platelet dysfunction by giving NSAIDs, aspirin, and other antiplatelets like clopidogrel. The side effect of our treatment is platelet dysfunction. We want platelet dysfunction to reduce arterial thrombosis, but sometimes we cause too much bleeding. The other big one is uremia. That is the BUN in the hundreds, triple digits, where people start getting altered and get that uremic frost. The way I picture this is the uremic frost you see on the skin. The same thing happens to platelets. The platelets get this frost on it and coat their 
receptors so that they cannot activate. So if you're thinking platelet dysfunction, think of von Willebrand's disease, that's there, but then be more mindful of the medical condition they're going on right now, the medications they're taking, or uremia. Let's jump back over to secondary hemostasis. You've clinically reasoned that they have a disease that, of secondary hemostasis, period. Getting the coag panel will not tell you anything extra. You know the coag panel will be abnormal. Instead, what you want to do is get a mixing study. And you get a mixing study because it will give you the coags and then it will tell you the difference between inhibitor disease or factor deficiency. Here's how the mixing study works. You take bad blood, the patient's blood, and you mix it with someone's good blood. That other person's good blood is going to have plenty of factors in it. When you mix the two, all of the abnormalities should resolve because you've taken the bad blood without factors and combined it with plenty of factors, and they correct. In that case, you said the original bad blood had a factor deficiency. If instead there's an inhibitor, that bad blood has plenty of factors. They've just developed antibodies to the factors so that when you combine it with good blood, there's more factors, but those inhibitors are still there. That is to say, if, if there is inhibitors there, the mixing study will not correct. Or if there is factor deficiency, it will correct. Inhibitor diseases is a hemonc specialty. You're going to type and cross them and get that special blood from out of state to give them the factors and blood they need. This happens generally with people who have congenital defects in their factors from birth. The hemophiliacs and even some sicklers. People who have required constant transfusion of blood product, they may develop inhibitors which prevent factors from working. But if you have a factor deficiency, now you're getting into where we see things more often because these people have a diagnosis. The guy comes in and says, I've got hemophilia, I have a hematoma on my knee. By the way, I have inhibitors, please get the blood from out of state. These people deal with it all the time. The people who don't deal with it all the time are going to be the people who do correct and have a factor deficiency. This is going to be the person we put on Coumadin and deprive them of their vitamin K. Or the person who eats a tea and toast diet and doesn't get enough vitamin K in their diet. In particularly, the person who's been in the ICU for two weeks who hasn't been fed. Think of vitamin K deficiency if their INR starts to go up. Coumadin use can do this. And what frustrates people is that the factor deficiencies can also be a product of cirrhosis, DIC, and von Willebrand's disease. Each of these three we saw in thrombocytopenia. Cirrhotics are always in a low-grade disseminated intravascular coagulation. And when you have disseminated intravascular coagulation, you make clots where they're not supposed to be, so you don't have anything left to make clots where you need them. And von Willebrand's disease it's, we thought was a problem with von Willebrand's factor, but it turns out von Willebrand's factor also stabilizes factor 8. This is where it gets a little frustrating, but you can see that if you have both platelet type bleeding and factor bleeding, your differential becomes very narrow. This was a lot in this lecture, and you're going to use these concepts again and again as we talk about hypercoagulability as well as thrombocytopenia. See how these the pathophysiology makes a lot of sense as you engage these other topics. So make sure you review this lecture more than once to really nail down primary and secondary hemostasis and then recognize that you can reason to most of the diagnoses with getting only one test. And then once you've reasoned there, you start getting more tests to exclude the deeper diagnoses. That is bleeding. We make these videos for free and we need your help. Please donate, because without your donations, we can't make any more videos. Please donate.